Hey there guys, and welcome to my Danganronpa Ultra Spare Girl Retrospective. I have gotten a couple of more subs here recently, so if you've never been to one of these, let me just sort of explain what this is for. I specialize in blind runs. Blind runs is my lifeblood. It's basically all I ever do, and I really, really, really love playing games blind. But the one kind of problem with that is that whenever I beat a game, I always give my thoughts, why does I beat the game, without really having time to stop and consider it. Uh, it's, it's more of my impressions immediately after beating the game, so I started doing this as a way to say, okay, you know what, it's been a few days since I beat the game, I, I've sat here, I've been able to think about it, I've been able to consider the plot as a whole, here's my analysis. Here's what worked in the game, here's what didn't work in the game. Here's what I liked, here's what I thought could have been done better, here's what I flat out didn't like at all and wish they hadn't done. So, um... Obviously, this is just my opinion. I, I'm not trying to say that if you disagree with this, then you're wrong, because that would be a really jerky thing to say, and I try not to say jerky things. So, first off, my, pl I, my, my analysis of the game overall hasn't actually changed all that much. Very, very often I'm able to, you know, come up with new things and new ideas and say better, you know, make better points after a little bit of time has gone by, but in all honesty, with Daganrapa 1.5 or Ultra Player Girls or whatever you want to call it, I do ultimately think the same now that I did right when I beat the game, which is basically the plot seemed largely forgettable. The plot seemed largely irrelevant. You know, it introduced Toa City and then it destroyed Toa City, and I, I guess the ending did leave Toa City as a place that could be rebuilt and it may come in, you know, become relevant later. But really, it just seemed like a location to destroy for the sake of the plot. You know, it introduced the Children of Hope. It killed most of them. Um, it introduced, you know, all the Monokuma kids are basically annulled by the end of it, and it's just like, almost none of the characters really seem to have a lasting impact. Um, but that said, absolutely, the reason to play this game is the characters. The characters were the best thing about it, and the, and the thing that, when I think when I think about Ultra Spare Girls, I always think of the characters, because the other than that, the plot just sort of existed. Before I get to the characters, though, I do want to mention briefly that, and I said this before, too, I do find Ultra Spare Girls to be the absolute best um, attempt at taking a game series to a completely different genre. You know, prior to this, I've played, of course, the arena games for Persona and Dancing All Night. Dancing All Night was just completely pointless, and I have no—it it, it seemed really like a waste of time, frankly. I, I don't know why they did that. The arena games, at least merged the two Persona, you know, teams together. It had interactions between Persona 3 and Persona 4 um, that were canonical. And it, you know, it, it was a fun romp, but again, it, I don't really feel like it progressed the world all that much. Other than to be like, hey, these guys aren't jerks to each other. Yay! Um, so I kind, of, I kind of feel like Persona 4 Arena was the best, and that was because Labrys' character was so interesting. But... Other than that, you know, everything that happened in Arena is just kind of feel goodsy, and there's not a whole lot about the world that was updated. And that's sort of the same way I feel about Ultra Despair Girls, which is the reason to play that is a deeper exploration of Toko and an introduction to Komaru. Because um, all the other characters are interesting, but not all that exciting, if, if that makes sense. Um, so. Let's talk about the characters, you know, kind of individually. First of all, let me talk about the Warriors of Hope. Um, one thing that frustrates me a little bit about the Warriors of Hope, and this sounds super sexist, I'm sorry, but it bothers me slightly that the two people that survived the Warriors of Hope were Monica and Katoka. Um, all of the guys died. And the reason that bothers me is not because I want women to die, obviously, but it's just one of the things that always I always really respected the Daganronpa series because they pulled no punches. They set up a scenario, and you couldn't, like, metagame, you know? It's like the women were just as likely to die as the men. And it, it, it set up a very, very, you know, you, you, can't, you can't take... They're not going to, you know, curb what they're going to do just in order to keep from offending specific people. No, they will go out, and they, you know, if everyone has an equal chance to die, and it, it, it is, it's a, it seems a little bit of a betrayal to the series that this time they just sort of had the women survive. Because it, it, it reminds me of like when the God of War series. God of War, you always go up and you fight all of the, you know, Greek gods, 
And except for Hera, I don't think Kratos ever fought any of the female gods, despite the fact there's a lot of them. But it's just, you know, it's... I feel like the censors knew if you if you have that level of brutality directed at a female, there's just... the censors are gonna go nuts, and so they just wouldn't do it. Um, and Danganronpa always was like, no, look, I mean, this is a situation, and... the sexes are actually equal. And it, this one just felt a little bit weird when I finished the game. I'm like, wait, why did they... what? So that was the one thing that bothered me a little bit. Um, Monica as a character, I didn't really dig all that much. Because it just at the end, a I don't I don't I still don't quite understand how she convinced all the kids to put on Monokuma helmets. They talk about how she has a power in order to get people to obey her, um, but we don't really see it that much. It seems like people just feel sorry for her, and somehow it's supposed to be that feeling sorry for her caused hundreds or possibly thousands of kids to put on these strange helmets that brainwash them. And also that they were able to make thousands of helmets to brainwash people without anyone noticing. The, the Monokumas is one thing. They explained how that got through the censors, and then eventually they had to keep doing it. But then brainwashing helmets that were the child size, no one, no one noticed that? You know, I'm just... that... it was confusing. Kotoko I thought was a really interesting, if tragic, character. Uh, oh, the Kotoko fight, where first she has that like bizarre tickle game with Komaru, and then... Um, I, I, I did love the fact that Genocide Jack got to fight her directly. Um, that was a lot of fun, but needless to say, I wasn't a huge fan of the fact that I'm basically stripping a 11-year-old girl. What? That, that, that really, really frustrated me. A lot. Um, I, it seemed completely pointless, and I, I'll get back to this later. I mean, you can kind of see that, um, I, I'm drawing in the background. Uh, obviously, we're six minutes in, so you probably can't see it all that much. But I'm drawing the fight between Toko and um, Komaru. And the other thing that kind of bothered me about that is, again, it, that one had bizarre fan service as well for really no reason. You know, I'm. I tend to think fan service is overdone. I tend to think fan service is. You know, kind of gets in the way of good gameplay because it makes the whole game seem kind of hackneyed and has things happen for no other reason than because. You, Hey, if this happens, we'll do something for the fans, rather than things happen because it actually makes sense. But if it does make sense, I don't mind it. I'm not, I'm not really a prude. Um, you know, I, I'll play Dragon Age, and I'll actually have the romances happen. I'm fine. But that, you know, and, and because of that, with Kotoku's arc, I didn't really mind it. It made me slightly uncomfortable, but it... It didn't bother me because she, her, her Kotoku's brain is kind of warped, and she thinks this kind of stuff is normal. Um, but with Koma, well, Kamaro and Toko, Toko has never shown any predilation towards cutting clothes off of other women in any other of her appearances. Komaru definitely has not been treated like that in any other part of the game, except for by, again by Kotoku. So that just seemed really pointless. Cat, will you please be quiet? I'm trying to record. Bad game. Sorry, guys. Uh, I swear, every time I start recording, they're just like, Oh, you're talking. You must be talking to me. I'm going to meow at you. No, shut up, cat. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the fan service just didn't make any dang sense in the game. And at least, especially the Toko versus Kamaru fight, it just seems tossed in there. And I don't know why. Um, for To a certain extent, I feel like they are trying to make fun of games that do that. But the message wasn't clear. It... it at the end, I was just sort of like, this just seems out of place and stupid. Um, that said, I one of my favorite parts of the entire game was the inclusion of Nikito. Nikito is right up there with Byakuya. In fact, Nikito may be a character I like even more than Byakuya. He is freaking hilarious. I mean, like, both of them are, but... Ah, Nikito just does such zany stuff, and it's just absolutely committed to his ideals, and he's he's so much fun to have around. I, I really feel like this game would be a lot more boring without him. He he was the, you know, interaction that I kept going forward to see, and I, I, I always loved the scenes he was in. That was fantastic. Um, Toko is probably the biggest reason that you should play this game, or the biggest thing I got out of playing this game, I guess I should say. Um, Toko... I, I know I said this in the actual Let's Play as well, but Toko's character, not Genocide's, but Toko's character was super, super, super uninteresting to me. It was like, she was a girl, and she was willing to put up with abuse, and she really liked Byakuya. 
And other than her being, you know, also genocide, you know, as far as Toko exclusive, exclusivity went, that was like her whole character. And it's like, it never really evolved. It never really changed. It was just sort of, oh, so here's a girl that gets abused a lot. Well, that's unfortunate. Um, and I, I never really, a lot of people talked about how they really liked Toko and Byakuya both, and I could not understand what they saw out of Toko. Toko seemed so dull and uninteresting to me. You know, it's like, when I beat Danganronpa 1, I was talking about my favorite characters, and I listed them, you know, um, Byakuya was number one, um, oh, the, um, detective, um, Kyoko? Kyoto? I don't remember her name. I'm gonna have to look it up, but um, the detective was my second favorite character. Um, I, you know, probably Makoto was my third, um, and then probably Hino was fourth, and then Toko just narrowly beat out Yasuhiro. Um, and so, and a lot of people were like, "Wow, Toko was like my second right after Byakuya." And I was like, "Why? She's so dull and uninteresting." And now I understand why this game put so, you know, you actually got to see Toko go through a transformation, and it was awesome. And you got to see her, you know, actually, the, the the speech she had where she's like, no, I, I can't pick between Komaru and Byakuya. They're both important to me, and I refuse to make that decision. So unexpected. So beautiful. And it's just, it really, I felt a theme song, you know, playing in my soul when I was watching that. It was, it was amazing. I thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Toko, and it, it kind of kills me just how bad a job I do at drawing Toko, because I do an okay job with Kamaru. Her face doesn't look quite right, but I do an okay job with Kamaru, but Toko just, you can tell it's Toko, but it's just not good. Um, but I, I really deeply, thoroughly enjoy Toko. Um, Kamaru is a Naegi. Um, <laughs> because one of the, on the one hand, I want to condemn her, because I'm like, I mean, Kamaru, I mean, she was a character, and she was kind of bland, and she just sort of you know, she, she had a spirit that wouldn't give up, and she, you know, she did evolve as the thing went through, but at the end of the, at the end of the game, she still seemed mostly bland and not all that interesting, and, and pretty ordinary, except for ant her antenna. But then I think about it, and I'm like, well, that's Makoto, too. Makoto has a spirit, and he won't give up, and he'll just keep trudging forward, and he's just, he just knows things are going to work out, even though he has no logical reason to think so, and so I'm like, you know what, yeah, they're... Komaru is Makoto's sister, and so despite the fact that I don't love her character, because I, I don't find her character all that expressively interesting, I will say she has a much better arc than Makoto. And you do actually have her voice change and become more resolute as time goes on, which is awesome. So, I, I like Komaru, but oh, Toko, like I said, is no reason to play this. Toko is amazing. Um... I did really love the twist on Shirokum at the end. How... Because I, I, I kind of thought that, um... Kurokuma was like the ultimate dark, and Shirokuma was the actual good Monokuma, and there had been some sort of like mistake when they were designed, and so the normal Monokumas have a little bit of both, and then the overriding directive, which is why they're funny but also sadistic, and then Kurokuma was just completely terrible, and then Shirokuma didn't have the sadistic part, and then at the end to find out that no, they're, bo they're both aiming towards the same goal. They both have like blackened souls inside was amazing, and I loved it. But that said, I'm glad they're destroyed. I'm glad they're not coming back. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that the... I, I, what is his name? It, it's the main character from Rapa 2, but it's not... Act, he had a different name um, when he was in that form. It, it wasn't... Um, it's not Nagy. But it, it wasn't the normal main character name. I am so bad with names, you guys. I am sorry. <laughs> if I cared more, then I would actually go back and, like, splice in me saying the name correctly at these. But I, I, that would be dishonest. I don't, I, don't, I don't like, you know, making myself see myself like I'm not. And what I am is someone who is terrible with names. Uh, the last thing I will say. The very last thing. Let's look forward a little bit. We have now beaten Danganronpa Ultra Despair Girls, and that does mean... Oh, and this scares me a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm going to be doing a disjointed Let's Watch of the Danganronpa 3 anime. All 24 episodes. Um... <sighs> Cat, will you please shut up? Jesus. Ah. Uh... 
crazy cab. I'm, uh, I almost want to re-record this, but it's been 14 minutes, so I really don't want to. So, I'm going to be doing the recording of the Daganropa 3 anime. Um, here's how it's going to work, because it's going to have to be a little bit different than my normal recordings. If you don't know why, the big reason is that when I do a Let's Play, there are some legal protections to what I'm doing. It, you can't... You can't effectively argue copyright infringement on a Let's Play, not that that stops companies from trying to do so, because a Let's Play and a video game are very disparate things. A video game, by its very definition, is is defined by its interactivity, and a Let's Play is not interactive. You know, it's it's a f piece of footage that nothing you do other than being able to pause it, you have no ability to alter what happens. So, because of that, there, the, it's very, very, very difficult to argue that fair use doesn't apply because a Let's Play is very distinct from a video game. A video game, like I said, is defined for being interactive. And so, the big question whenever you claim copyright infringement is, does the thing that is infringing replace the need for the original? And you can't argue that it does for a video game. For an anime, though, it gets trickier. And so, what you can expect is, I will post one episode at a time, and it, I'm going to be somewhat modeling it after what Nostalgia Critic does, because he does a fantastic job with this. Specifically the older Nostalgia Critics, before he did so many skits. Um, but I'll sit there, I'll talk you through the episode. You know, kind of explain what happens in scenes I didn't have a necessary a reaction to. Or just, you know, I will talk about what happens, then play the reaction, then talk about what happens up until my next reaction. I cannot just play the episode and have my reactions kind of be over the top of it, because I just, I, don't, I feel like that actually could potentially negatively affect their sales. But I figure, with, with a lot of cutting, so that um, you were able to follow the plot without actually seeing significant portions of the anime, and really just see my reaction to what's going on, you'll be, it will be entertaining enough that, you know, you guys will have a reason to watch, it won't be so disjointed that unless you've seen the anime you can't watch it, but it also, you know, will hopefully you know, people that are really interested, drive them to go actually buy the anime to see all the stuff I'm cutting out. So, kind of a best of both worlds thing. So, um, you can expect that to happen in about two days or so. Sorry, in about four days or so. And we're going to do it for the next couple of months. Up until, probably by the time we finish it, Daganropa 3, the actual game, will just be coming out. Um, I, I am hopeful, because that comes out in September, and we are now in May. Although, by the time this is posted, we may be in June. So, June, July, August, and September. We have about four months to get through 24 episodes. That's kind of tight. Um, but I am, I, I am actually planning on, once I finish World of Final Fantasy, just making this a uh, every other day upload. More about that when Final Fantasy is over. Because the short version is that while I was playing this and while I'm playing World of Final Fantasy, I'm noticing that my my drive to play the games and my interest level is suffering to a certain degree because it's four days between recording sessions, and that is just too long. I'm just I'm I'm, I'm feeling disconnected from the source material. That's the longest I've ever gone without recording this stuff. So I am thinking that um, I'm either going to do one of two things. I'm either going to go ahead and record more at a time, and then so that I can upload, basically on like a Sunday, I will record a game for like an hour and a half to two hours, cut it into four episodes, and then be able to upload those more so I'm getting through more of the game at once and I'm able to have a higher level of involvement, or I'll just have, you know, alternate between my mystery game and my personal queue, so that... Whenever I'm playing the mystery queue, the episodes will be every other day, but then when I finish, I'll jump over to the other queue, which is the one that World of Final Fantasy and Undertale and all of those are in. But like I said, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm spoiling myself, which is, as a blind runner, something I should never do. So once I finish World of Final Fantasy, I will post a video, kind of get everyone's thoughts. If you want to give your thoughts on this video, feel free, but be aware... I know a lot of people didn't watch Ultra Despair Girls, so I will be posting a separate video, just kind of asking about that specifically. Because I think that's worth doing. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. Hopefully I didn't ramble too much, although it's sort of what I do. So, I will see you all in the next one. Remember, four days we start Daganrapa 3, the end of Hope's Peak. Look forward to it, guys!